How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Let us pray together. O thou who art sovereign, almighty, and everywhere present, the everlasting God, to whom all glory and honor and praise doth rightly belong, we come to offer our worship on thy day before thy throne. We come as debtors to mercy and to grace. In mercy thou hast forgiven all our sins for Christ's sake. And in grace thou hast bestowed upon us the right to eternal life. Again, on the ground of Christ and what he has done for us. We come therefore debtors to mercy and to grace. We come to acknowledge thy great kindness to us and thy goodness. Help us to remember all that we have received and to be a grateful people, thankful even on this day for what has preceded it in the way of temporal and spiritual blessings this past week. Prayers have been answered, grace and comfort has been given, and thou hast been near us in times of great trial. We thank thee for the abiding presence of God, that we are ever in the shadow of the Almighty and in the secret place of the Most High. Now do pardon our sins afresh, we pray, and make us to feel the power of that pardon in our hearts, so that we may draw near to God without any distraction, without any apprehension of being turned aside or forbidden access. We come in the name of Jesus Christ. Our words are worthy as the Lamb. And we pray that as thou art pleased in him, thou wouldst be pleased also with his people who trust in him for everlasting life. Pardon us then, renew us, and fill us with joy and with peace in our believing, and be present with us throughout this service, and with all thy people, in every place. Amen. We sing to God's praise from the Psalm 20. The Psalm 20. That's on page 19 in the Red Psalter. Psalm 20, we're singing verses 1 to 5 only, and the tune is Orton, which is 215. Orton 215. Psalm 20, verses 1 to 5. Jehovah, hear thee in the day when trouble he doth send, and let the name of Jacob's God thee from all ill defend. O oh, let him help, send from above, out of his sanctuary, from Zion, his own holy hill, let him give strength to thee. Psalm 20, verses 1 to 5. Jehovah, hear thee in the day when trouble he doth send, and let the name of 
Jacob's God, there from all ill depends. Oh, let him help send from above out of his sanctuary. From Zion, his own holy hill, let him give strength to thee. Let him remember all thy gifts, accept thy sacrifice. Grant thee thine heart's wish and fulfill thy thoughts and counsels wise. In thy salvation we Play upon us and the Lord, thy prayers all fulfill. It is our custom and way to read the Scriptures consecutively, and so we are reading through the Old Testament, first of all, and we have reached Numbers chapter 2. There is, as in all these early chapters of Numbers, a great deal of detail, and after the reading I will give brief comment so that we can derive some spiritual help from these words. Numbers chapter 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house, far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. And on the east side, toward the rising of the sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies. And Nation, the son of Aminadab, shall be captain of the children of Judah. And his host and those that were numbered of them were threescore and fourteen thousand and six hundred. And those that do pitch next unto him shall be the tribe of Issachar, the Neath and Neolithite son of Zuar shall be captain of the children of Issachar. And his host and those that were numbered thereof were fifty and four thousand and four hundred. And the tribe of Zebulun and Eliab, the son of Helan, shall be captain of the children of Zebulun. And his host and those that were numbered thereof were fifty and seven thousand and four hundred. And all that were numbered in the camp of Judah were an hundred thousand and fourscore thousand and six thousand and four hundred throughout their armies. These shall first set forth. On the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben, according to their armies. And the captain of the children of Reuben shall be Elizer, the son of Shadir. And his host and those that were numbered thereof were forty and six thousand and five hundred. And those which pitched by him shall be the tribe of Simeon, and the captain of the children of Simeon shall be Shalumiel, the son of Zurashaddai. 
And his host and those that were numbered of them were fifty and nine thousand and three hundred. Then the tribe of Gad, and the captain of the sons of Gad shall be Eliasaph, the son of Ruel. And his host and those that were numbered of them were forty and five thousand and six hundred and fifty. And all that were numbered in the camp of Reuben were an hundred thousand and fifty and one thousand and four hundred and fifty throughout their armies, and they shall set forth in the second rank. Then the tabernacle of the congregation shall set forward with the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camp. As they encamp, so shall they set forward, every man in his place, by their standards. On the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Ephraim, according to their armies, and the captain of the sons of Ephraim shall be Elishama, the son of Amahud. And his host and those that were numbered of them were forty thousand and five hundred, and by him shall be the tribe of Manasseh, and the captain of the children of Manasseh shall be Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur. And his host and those that were numbered of them were thirty and two thousand and two hundred. Then the tribe of Benjamin and the captain of the sons of Benjamin shall be Abidon, the son of Gideonai, and his host and those that were numbered of them were thirty and five thousand and four hundred. All that were numbered of the camp of Ephraim were an hundred thousand and eight thousand and a hundred throughout their armies, and they shall go forward in the third rank. The standard of the camp of Dan shall be on the north side of their armies, and the captain of the children of Dan shall be Ahiezer, the son of Amishadai. And his host and those that were numbered of them were threescore and two thousand and seven hundred. And those that encamped by him shall be the tribe of Asher, and the ch captain of the children of Asher shall be Pegil, the son of Achran. And his host and those that were numbered of them were forty and one thousand and five hundred. Then the tribe of Naphtali and the captain of the children of Naphtali shall be Ahira, the son of Enan. And his host and those that were numbered of them were fifty and three thousand and four hundred. All that they were numbered in the camp of Dan were an hundred thousand and fifty and seven thousand and six hundred. They shall go hindmost with their standards. And these are those which were numbered of the children of Israel by the house of their fathers. All those that were numbered of the camps throughout their hosts were six hundred thousand and three thousand and five hundred and fifty. But the Levites were not numbered among the children of Israel as the Lord commanded Moses. The children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so they pitched by their standards, and so they set forward, every one after their families, according to the house of their fathers. And so reads God's word. Well, we have a little insight uh, this morning as to why this book is called the Book of Numbers. That chapter alone contains many and various numbers. The purpose of what takes place in this chapter is to order the tribes as they commence their march through the wilderness. As chapter 1 makes clear, at this point of time the children of Israel are gathered before Mount Sinai and the law is being given to them and then other matters are dealt with, including the numbering of every tribe. And in this particular chapter, uh, the ordering of every tribe as to what their position will be as they march with the tabernacle in the very midst of them and through the wilderness which lies before them. Now, what do we just see in this? Well, it is an Old Testament picture, a prefiguring, 
really, of the church. When we read all the detail here, we mustn't get lost in the detail, but see a marching host from Sinai even to the promised land. And it speaks to us of the church, churches on the move, making progress, uh, making its course through the wilderness of this world and in the hope of reaching its destination, which is the heavenly Canaan, the better country that is the heavenly. Moses and Aaron are appointed the mediators, verse 1, through whom God will speak to all the children of Israel, and he assigns to each one of the tribes a certain place. We notice that uh, Judah is the first mentioned because Judah is to lead the people of God. He has a preeminence by reason of prophecy and also by reason of what is to come, that of that tribe uh, the Lord Jesus Christ will ultimately proceed. So verse 9 speaks of the camp of Judah. These shall first set forth. Now, what are the truths to glean from the chapter as a whole? We can't go into uh, detail this morning, obviously, and it's just one or two general comments to make the chapter relevant to us. Well, the first thing that occurs to me when I read this chapter is that we all have a place in God's church. A place has been assigned to us as surely as a place was assigned to each tribe and to each member of the tribe. We find our place and we hold our place and we must be faithful in that place and we must serve the Lord in that place and we must see to it that our presence helps the church of God in that place. And secondly, we are to remember from this chapter that we're not on our own. If we look at the chapter in its detail and try to form a kind of picture of what is described here, uh, here's the tabernacle in the very center, three tribes up front, followed by the Levites, three tribes uh, on top there, or on the further side, three tribes on the near side, three tribes at the back. And the tabernacle moves through the wilderness with all these persons gathered around it, thousands upon thousands of people. So it must have been a very impressive sight. And in a way, it's an encouraging sight because... We're not alone. We are surrounded by our brethren and our sisters in the Christian church too. And they're on the right-hand side and the left-hand side. And we're walking together. And if there's an attack, then we're all there to, fend one an to defend one another. If there's a need, we're all there to make supply to the needy. So we thank God for the fellowship which exists in his church. And that was one reason, of course, why we need to preserve unity and keep together, because we are strong when we are as one body. So that's the second thing. And the third thing that is repeated over and over again is that each tribe was to be by his standard. If I take one text, for example, out of many that could be quoted, verse 17, every man in his place by their standards. 
And our standard is the Word of God. That banner spoken of in Psalm 60, which is displayed because of the truth. Or to describe it more narrowly, the standard is the gospel within the word of God. And we all believe it, and we want to see it supported, and we want to see it carried through the world. And so when we imagine what this scene must have been with all these tribes, with their standards raised, their flags waved, and every tribe under that tribe's particular standard. And so it is in the Christian church. We must take our place under the word of God, submit to it, be faithful to it, and bear it before the world, the standard of God's word. The fourth thing we can learn from this chapter is that the church must move forward. Again, in verse 17, to take one out of many references, so shall they set forward. The church is on the move. It must seek to make progress under God, be blessed under God. Sometimes people make critical remarks about the church of God that so often the church is slow. I remember as a child hearing another child saying, I suppose it was a reference to the hymn, like a mighty army moves the church of God. And it was um, changed somewhat. And like a mighty tortoise moves the church of God. It's slow instead of making good progress. Well, the church mustn't be slow. It must make advance in every area, looking to God to give that advance and that strength. And then, fifthly, there is to be, from time to time, for all the tribes, an encamping. And that's mentioned also in this uh, chapter, again in verse 17, in the midst of the camp, as they encamp, so shall they set forward. And the purpose of the encampment and the rest on the journey was, of course, to renew their strength so that they would uh, have the ability and the power to advance the next day or when the time of rest had come to an end. And so it is with God's people. They need times of quiet, times of refreshment, times like the Sabbath day when they take rest, find encouragement, and then the church moves into activity and into service. Well, at the end of the march, they cross over Jordan into the promised land. And it's the same with the children of God today. At the end of our march, we must move over the river of death and enter that inheritance which God has promised to them that love him. And it's better, Hebrews 11 says, than Canaan, which was a land flowing with milk and honey, a land which is likened to the Garden of Eden in the Old Testament. But our inheritance is better than, than that, by far. It's the better country, that is, a heavenly. And it's what God has prepared from the foundation of the world for all his people. And in a way, remembering that gives us heart, you see. It's not a journey to nowhere. We're not going to all perish in the wilderness. It's a journey to a promised land. So we keep rank and we keep our eyes upon the Lord and his standard 
and we faithfully continue in the faith until we reach heaven. And if such a difficult chapter as this is read with an eye to these things, it will assume a relevance and we will gain instruction from it. And the word of God, even in such a place as this, will be reckoned profitable for doctrine, for teaching. Well, may the Lord help us to see these things and to remember them in our Christian lives. Now we sing from Psalm 78. The Psalm 78. And the tune is Caithness, which is number 40 in the Red Psalter. The tune 40, Caithness. And we are singing verses 51 to 55. 51 to 55. In Egypt land, the firstborn all, he smote down everywhere. Among the tents of Ham, even these chief of their strength that were. But his own people, like to sheep, thence to go forth he made. And he amidst the wilderness them as a flock did lead. And he them safely on did lead, so that they did not fear, whereas their enemies by the sea quite overwhelmed were. To borders of his sanctuary the Lord his people led, even to the mount which his right hand for them had purchased. The nations of Canaan by his almighty hand before their face he did expel out of their native land, which for inheritance to them by line he did divide, and made the tribes of Israel within their tents abide. Verse 51 to verse 55. In Egypt land the firstborn all he smote down everywhere among the tents of Ham in this life of their strength that were. But his own people like to sheep thence to go forth he made and he amidst the wilderness them as a flock did lead and he them safely on did lead so that they did not fear whereas their enemies by the sea quite overwhelmed were to borders of his sanctuary the Lord his people led him to the mount which his right hand for them had purchased. The nations of Canaan by his almighty hand before their face he did expel out of the native land, which for inheritance to them by line he did divide, and made the tribes of Israel within their tents above.
The reading from the New Testament is taken from the Gospel of Luke and chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 41. Luke chapter 8 and verse 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman, having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee, and press thee, and sayest thou who touch me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared unto him, before all the people, for what cause she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not. Believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, and the father and mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not. She is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again. And she arose straightway. And he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Let us further come before God in prayer. Almighty God, thou who art the creator and preserver of men, Unto thee, men in their need instinctively turn, knowing that there is none like thee, that all power resides in thee, and thou hast the ability to answer prayers, even the greatest of them, according to thine own greatness and graciousness. We come to thee as the God who has manifested himself as our Redeemer in the Lord Jesus Christ, who has paid a great price, even the Savior's blood, to secure us for thyself. 
and we come to thee thine by creation and preservation but thine also by redemption we ask for thy kindness to be toward us suffer us a season in thy presence mind not our sins O God but forgive them all and cleanse our hearts from all stain from all blemish we pray that we may be restored to be in a good spiritual state before thee that we may be effective intercessors some of us have come through difficulties this past week but our testimony is that our God has been near at hand to help ever faithful ever helpful and we thank thee for those mercies which we've received the consolation that has been imparted to us the strength which has been renewed to us the hope which has been granted to us we thank thee that thou hast kept us even by thy power perhaps in times of great darkness great weakness times of great sadness that thou hast been our guardian and our guide and we thank thee for it we give thee thanks especially for help given to our friends Johnny and Joe with us again today and the whole family and we were very sad indeed to hear of the death of Joe's mother but we are thankful that thou hast shown thyself to be a God and father to them and that thou hast been near to them to support them in this very difficult time and together as a church we remember them and pray that thou wouldst proceed still to give them mercies new every morning and that thy kindness may faithfully continue toward them great is thy faithfulness we pray particularly for Joe's father and pray that he may know the full comfort and strength of the gospel and the true nature of the Christian hope we're so thankful that he with us believes in the only Savior of men as Joe's mother also did and therefore the darkness is relieved by the light of the gospel by the light of Christian hope by the light of heaven continue to be with thy servants hold their hand and say to them fear not I am with thee we do pray also for Sue Richardson's father at this critical time for him suffering he is from this cancer and we do pray that thou would give him physical relief from any pain or discomfort above all we pray for him that his spiritual eyes may be opened to the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ and that he may be drawn to Christ as the days pass and we pray that we may hear the good news that his trust is in the Redeemer and he has peace do bless him and his dear wife at this time 
Sue and the children and all the family. We lovingly and prayerfully commend them to thine unfailing grace. We pray for Peter Bravery also, recovering from this major surgery. We're so grateful for the progress already made. Pray that this may continue, that each day he may grow stronger. To remind him of the prayers of God's people, and we pray that he will find strength for it every day. That as his days and their demands, so his strength may be. We do pray for Roger Bolton too, and pray for thy good hand to be upon him, recovery, and a real turning around in this situation, that he will find again the health which once he knew. We remember John Beadle and pray that thou wouldst give her the sense of the Saviour's nearness at this time nearing the end of her life. We pray that her, her trust may be in the Lord, that her soul may be entrusted to his keeping. We pray for all these dear ones. There are others too with problems of age and weakness. We do remember one another. We are all needy. We need thee, but we need each other to show care and compassion, sympathy, and love. And we pray that none may be forgotten, none may be omitted from our prayers. Be pleased, O God, in thy mercy to continue with us, to bless those away from us, many this weekend on holiday. We pray that they may be given real rest, that they may come back wonderfully restored, that thou wouldst grant them a time of rest and peace, but also enjoyment and happiness. Remember all the church and all its members, and remember the church of Christ in the land. I'm grateful for the fellowship we enjoy from week to week with other believers from other churches. Glad to see friends here from Penzance this morning, and we pray for the pastor there, Jonathan Stobbs, and his ministry, the oversight, the deacons, the members, that thou wouldst bless that ministry wonderfully in the days to come, and make thy servant there to be a true, able, and faithful minister of Jesus Christ. We remember him today with great affection and with like desire that he will know the blessing of God on his ministry. So remember all like churches, faithful and true in the land and the world over. Grant access to the unbelieving multitudes of this world May missionaries be raised up to take the gospel where perhaps it has never been before. And that thy people may raise high the standard which we have been given. Do bless thy church, O God, and grant that like the tribes of Israel it may advance and that it may no progress and much encouragement. Revive us by thy spirit. Keep us true to thy holy word. 
And may the days before us be days fraught with blessing, days wherein we know the showers of blessing of which we read in thy word. Hear our prayer. Minister to all our needs as we open thy word now, as we read it and consider it together. May it be a blessing to us, be as the dew which falls upon the dry ground, rain upon the mown grass. So may we derive good from thy word, such good as will keep us in future days, whatever those days may hold for us. We ask all these things, commending ourselves and our families, our children, our grandchildren, and all we love unto thee, in our Savior's name. Amen. We'll sing now from Psalm 30. The Psalm 30. The tune is St. Minenver, which is 220. The tune 220. Psalm 30, verses 1 to 5. Lord, I will thee extol, for thou hast lifted me on high, and over me thou to rejoice, maidst not mine enemy. O thou who art the Lord my God, I in distress to thee with loud cries lifted up my voice, and thou hast healed me. Psalm 30, verses 1 to 5.
we turn to the closing words of Paul's letter to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, and we read from verse 15. (coughs) Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, and Nymphas, and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that likewise ye, likewise ye read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Now, the series of studies which we have had in the epistle to the Colossians began, I see from my records, on the 22nd of February, 2015. And that series concludes this morning as we look at the final verses of this epistle. These verses contain... Paul's last instructions. There are here greetings to be passed on to other churches and persons. Instruction that the epistle is to be read in the church at Colossae and at Laodicea and that the letter presently at Laodicea should be read also in Colossae, a personal message to Archippus, and then a parting word from the Apostle, which includes his signature by his own hand at the end of the letter. Now, if we take a general look at these verses, we can sum everything up, I think, in two words, pastor and people. I'm thinking of the church at Colossae, pastor and people. So I'm not going to take these verses in the order they appear, but I'm going to refer to the various verses as we look at the passage under those headings. First of all, pastor, and I refer you to verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, and fulfill it. Now the question arises in our minds, who was Archippus? Now, apart from this reference in Colossians 4.17, he only appears in one other verse in the New Testament. And that is in the short epistle of Paul to Philemon. And that letter opens thus. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Now that's quite an important cross-reference, quite an important verse to consider, because it would appear in that greetings are sent to Philemon and Aphia, which appear to be man and wife, and then to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. 
that Philemon, Aphia, and Archippus belong to the same family and in their house the church of God regularly met. It would therefore appear, if that is a right assumption, I believe it is, that Archippus was a son of Philemon and Aphia. But we can glean a little more from this other verse because Paul describes him as our fellow soldier. Archippus, our fellow soldier. Now that expression occurs several times in the New Testament and I think practically always it refers to another minister, a minister of the word of God. Epaphroditus, for example, in Philippians 2.25, described as my brother, companion in labor, and fellow soldier. And we could think of 2 Timothy and chapter 2 and the opening verses of that chapter where Paul is writing to his son Timothy who's minister at Ephesus telling him to be strong in the grace which is in Christ Jesus and then in verse 3 2 Timothy 2 3 he says thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So the title is usually given, practically always given, to another minister. And in fact, in this verse, Colossians 4.17, Archippus is told to take heed to the ministry which thou hast received. He has been called to serve in this particular way. By grace he's enlisted under the banner of the truth of God and he's fighting the good fight. The same as the, Apo the Apostle Paul did who at the end of his life could say I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. And what is a minister fighting for or fighting with or fighting against? Well, the minister of the Word of God is fighting against error and false doctrine. He's contending against unbelief and he is also grappling with wickedness in its various manifestations. He wants so much to turn error to truth, to tr turn unbelief to faith and wickedness to holiness. And that is what Archippus is still to do at Colossae. Now, we can go a little further because according to uh, chapter 1 of the epistle to the Colossians and verse 7, Epaphroditus is referred to in a way that makes him look as if he is the minister at Colossae. He tells them that they knew the grace of God in truth as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. This clearly 
implies that Epaphroditus was once the pastor of the Colossian church. He taught them the gospel and the doctrine which they now receive. You've learned of Epaphras, which means that he was uh, the preacher there in Colossae, ministering the word of God. He is also called something very similar, a fellow servant. Again, suggesting that he is with Paul in the ministry, serving the Lord. And then it's clinched by a faithful minister of Jesus Christ. Now, it was this man who, according to chapter 1, verse 8, who declared unto Paul and the others their love in the Spirit. So this man has gone to Rome to search out the apostle, probably because of the problems arising in the Colossian church. He wants counsel and he wants the apostle's insight and his advice on what to do. And he is presently in Rome with the apostle. Now we know that from chapter 4 and verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. So he's in Rome, having sought out the apostle, and at the present time he has no intention of returning to Colossae. For greetings are sent, but he's not sent with Tychicus and Onesimus, the bearers of the letter. So he's staying at Rome. Now who's going to take his place while he's away from Colossae? Who's going to teach the people, pastor the people? Archippus. This man, Archippus, has been called of the Lord, and he is entrusted now with the ministry. Take heed to Archippus, or say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, and fulfill it. Now, if you ponder those words, they strongly suggest that his installation in the pastorate at Colossae is a fairly recent event, because he's got to mind his calling, which has been received, i.e. recently received, and he's got to fulfill it, that's carry it out which perhaps at the time of writing he's only begun to do. So I see the situation as this. Epaphras was converted when Paul was in this part of the world uh, many years before. He went to Colossae. Paul didn't. But he went to Colossae or lived there and he began to teach them what he'd heard from the lips of Paul and through his passing on the message of the gospel, people were converted and a church was established. They called Epaphras to be the pastor. But things have become increasingly difficult and Epaphras needs apostolic insight and counsel. So he travels to Rome to see the apostle. It may be months, it may be years that he is away. But the Lord puts his hand upon Archippus. The church calls this man to take the place of Epaphras. And so at the time of writing this epistle, Archippus is pastor of the people. Now, 
he has a ministry. Take heed to the ministry. The word used here is the word from which we get the word deacon. And it really means a service. It's most unlikely, however, that it's being used in an official sense here as the service of a deacon. Why should that be highlighted in this way? And you wouldn't normally, Paul wouldn't call a deacon a fellow soldier. So it's likely that this word ministry is used in its more general sense, which it is repeatedly in the New Testament for one who's engaged in any kind of special service. Archippus was newly called to the ministry of the Word and of the sacrament. He was appointed to the pastorate there in Colossae. Now this is a responsibility which he must take very seriously. Paul says, thou hast received this ministry in the Lord. How has he received it? Well, he has been called by the Lord, receiving a conviction in his own heart and an awareness that this is God's will for his life. How shall they preach except they be sent? He feels that he's been singled out, set apart by the Lord for this ministry. He was then given the gifts which he needed for being a good minister. He was able to study the Word of God. He, he was able and had an ability to prepare messages to deliver to the people. He had a good gift of presentation. He could set forth the truth and a care for those under his charge. So the Lord blessed him for this work. And then the Lord granted him his own authority so that he was able to teach and exhort as young Titus was with all authority. When a man knows that God has called him to a particular station and has given him the gifts to serve in this place, the Lord also grants authority makes him an able minister of the New Testament. And so he received the ministry of the Lord himself. And this was recognized by the church, just as it was in Acts 13, when the Spirit of God laid it upon the church to set apart Paul and Barnabas for a special ministry. So the order of things is the church calls the man, his calling is tested by the church, the church judges the matter, and after deliberation comes to the conclusion that this is the one upon whom God has laid his hand. He's the one to take this responsibility. And so the church elects him first, chooses him. Just like in Acts 1, the church chose an apostle to replace Judas Iscariot. In Acts 6, they, they chose deacons to serve at tables. And in Acts 14, they chose elders 
in the various churches, which would have included, of course, teaching elders. And so the man was doubly called by the Lord and by the church. And he received the ministry. The ministry thou hast received. In what respects was it received? Well, it was received as something entrusted to him. And he assumed responsibility for this ministry. Now, Paul refers to this in several places. In 1 Timothy 1.11, he speaks of the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Then in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2 and verse 4, we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. So he's received it, and he's received it with all due responsibility because he has got to exercise it, and he's got to fulfill it. He's got to use this ministry to God's glory and to the good of souls. Now Paul says... Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord. Don't overlook that. It means in union with Christ, he'd received this solemn responsibility. So it was the Lord who put him into this position. As he was in union with Christ, in fellowship with Christ, Christ gave him this duty to preach, to administer the ordinances, and to care for the flock of God. It's the Lord then who bestowed the ministry upon him. It's the Lord who granted him all needful grace. It's the Lord who bestowed upon him the gift of the Holy Spirit, the supply of the Spirit of Christ Jesus. And it's the Lord who would be with him in his service. And it's the Lord to whom he owes responsibility for faithful ministry and continuing ministry, and it is to the Lord that he will one day give account as a steward of the gospel. It's all in connection with the Lord. And a pastor is always to remember that he may be servant to the church, which he is, but he's servant of the Lord, which he also is. And the Lord is his master, not the officers of the church or the members of the church. The Lord is his master. He's received his ministry in the Lord. And that Lord who's with Archippus will so bless him that he will have fruit for his labor. In the mercy of God, you'll see converts. He will see growth in the church spiritually as well as numerically. And it will all be brought about, of course, by the Lord who's with him. In the Lord. Now we've not finished yet with this pastor because Paul says, take heed. Take heed to the ministry, Archippus, which thou hast received in the Lord. The word there is the same word as in Colossians 2 verse 8 at the beginning of that verse. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Beware. 
Beware in the ministry which thou hast received. Which means that Archippus must be very watchful and he must be very careful. The duties of the ministry are demanding. But Archippus must take every measure to ensure that he is faithful in what appears to be an ever-increasingly unfaithful day. He must be aware of himself so that he ever lives up to the doctrine which he is declaring and impressing upon others. Not like the priest in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, who was very good at telling others how to live, but lived not well himself. I can't quite recall how Chaucer puts it now, but something like he points to others the stony, narrow way and takes himself the pathway strewn with flowers. He mustn't do that. He must be an example to the believers in word and in all behavior. Beware of failing in that respect. Beware, Archippus, of not trying to serve the whole church. Some ministers have spoiled their ministry by having very special friends. And then jealousy arises from others and resentment. Before long, there's factions within the church. The minister must never do that, though he has friends of God's people. But he must make sure there's no favoritism shown or that he has special friends in confidence. That's not looking after the whole flock of the Lord. Beware of that. Beware of temptation, Archippus, to divert you from your main task. I suppose the great idol today is sport, isn't it? I must say when on the news, and I am rather addicted to the news, I must say, but uh, you see sometimes when it comes to the spotlight on sport, vast uh, auditoriums filled with people, thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of people, all watching people play with the ball. And you think to yourself, wouldn't it be wonderful if they came to church? No, their love is elsewhere. They've chosen an idol rather than the living God. Now, why am I referring to that? Well, only because I've known ministers who've got the same passion for sport and every Saturday they'll be watching the home side or the club that they support, playing football or whatever. Is that the best way, I wonder, to prepare for the Sabbath day? To prepare a message from God for the people? Now, I'm not being a killjoy and saying there should be no place at all for sport. I'm sure it's a healthy pastime and I'm not prejudiced against it, but I am saying the minister must be aware lest it becomes something of a diversion. He must give himself wholly to the ministry of the Word of God. Beware that he doesn't neglect prayer and thinks the ministry is all about preparing sermons. Beware that he doesn't play down the importance of visiting those in need, those who need his help. 
is to beware of the fear of men. I have known ministers who quake before a woman in the congregation, frightened to tell it as it is because he'll, he'll get an earful at the door when the sermon's over. He must rise above that. Rise above that. It may not be a woman, it may be a church officer or a prominent man in the church who can make life extremely difficult. <laughs> he is the servant of Jesus Christ. If I please men, Paul writes to the Galatians, I would not be the servant of Jesus Christ. When he preaches, the only person he sees before him is the king. And to that king, he will one day be called to give account. He must honor the king. He must preach his word in season, out of season. He must be faithful to him and not bow down to some individual who is fairly formidable, perhaps even a man instilling fear. He mustn't be discouraged. Beware. Now, there is much to discourage a man in the ministry, dealing with people. People are difficult sometimes. They're awkward. If we perhaps weren't called of God into the ministry, we'd never put up with them. But a minister must do that. More than put up with them, he must love them as Christ redeemed people and he must look after them. Beware. Beware that you fail in that regard. And this ministry must be fulfilled. Take heed to the ministry, Archippus, which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Now, the word is a very full one. It means that Archippus is to do everything devolving upon a ministry of this kind. There is to be in Archippus no tendency to slack. I knew someone in the ministry who used to say sometimes, well, he hadn't prepared properly, but uh, he would fly with the wind on this sermon, meaning he hopes it would come to him when he was up there in the pulpit. You should never do that. Never do that. If it hasn't come to you before you get into the pulpit, you shouldn't be in the pulpit, full stop. Fulfill it then. Don't slack. Don't compromise. Some men, in order to avoid trouble, would compromise with sin and not take the necessary step of church discipline. Now John Knox would tell us that there are three infallible marks to a true church. One is the sound preaching of the word of God. The second is the right administration of the ordinances. And the third is a godly church discipline. If that third and last is missing, it raises a very serious question as to whether that church is a biblical apostolic church. But some men think to themselves, well, if I take this discipline, if I reprove this man, if I suspend him, if I bring him to the elders and the church to remove him, it'll cause trouble. If it is necessary, then we must let the trouble come. 
but we cannot compromise with the Lord or with his church. He must continue in the ministry, fulfill it. He must hold out in the ministry, even though times are very difficult, even though he gets frustrated and depressed, even though he's ready, as we say, to throw in the towel. Fulfill it. As long as the Lord wants you in that place, preaching his word, leading his people, stay there. He must not leave a ministry half fulfilled because of pressure. Why did Paul include this in his letter, I wonder? Well, it's there, isn't it? Say to Archippus, the church is addressed, the church of Colossae. Church is there to see that the man doesn't lose heart. He doesn't succumb to depression. He doesn't reach the point at which he's ready to give up. The church, the whole church, should support him in prayer, encourage him with words, and declare their faithfulness to him. Say to Archippus, fulfill the ministry. Don't make it more difficult for him. Don't add to his problems. Gently encourage him to go on. Because the Colossians must show that they appreciate Archippus. They benefit from his ministry. They won't, don't want him to fall by the wayside. They want him to tell them the whole counsel of God. They want him to shepherd them through the wilderness. So they stand by them. They do all they can to help him. And they say to him, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received of the Lord that thou fulfill it. I'll turn then to people. The people at Colossae. I don't spend so long with this because the information we're given is scant here. The first thing I notice about these church members, if you like, at Colossae, is that they have a love for all Christian believers. Paul writes to them in verse 15, Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, and Nymphas, and the church which is in his house, which may be a second church near to Laodicea, for all we know. But they were to make contact with them, they were to greet them. They were to lovingly to embrace them in the Lord and pass on Paul's salutations at the same time. People must never be parochial in church life thinking, well, I, I attend the service and I come to the meetings. That's my little bit. No, no, no. Outside of us, all around us, in various faithful gospel churches, there are other believers. Our hearts must go out to them. And we must make contact with them. And make friendships with them. Salute the brethren, which are in Laodicea, and Nymphus, and the church, which is in their house. Show affection to believers everywhere and anywhere. Let brotherly love continue. So these people at Colossae had a large heart.
I remember at one time the late Gordon Hawkins was in the car with me and he'd been critical because he'd invited a certain, he had been criticised rather, because he'd invited a certain man to preach. I think it was at the spring meetings in Watersham. And some people didn't think this man was as sound and orthodox as perhaps he should have been, although I'm sure he was, knowing Gordon. But he spoke to me in the car about how narrow some people are. And I can remember him saying this, and it stuck with me through the years, Malcolm, my heart is as big as the election of grace. Meaning that he loved God's elect wherever he found them. And I think we need the same Catholic heart. So they loved believers. Be a loving church. Take interest in others. Some of us went to Ibsley on Friday night for the prayer meeting. They loved to see us there and other friends joining with them for prayer. And it's one practical way in which we can show our love to them. There awaits you hug after hug at Ibsley. <laughs> They're so delighted to see you. Squeeze the very breath out of you in their thankfulness. We should love them and others too. And what about the church at Colossae? Well, Paul says in verse 16, when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read in the church of the Laodiceans and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Oh, they didn't just have a concern for Christians outside the church, but they behaved well inside the church according to Paul's instructions, because verse 16 implies that they would regularly gather together. As Paul writes to the Corinthians, when you come together. They kept the Sabbath day, because it was on the Sabbath they all came together. As at Troas, on the first day of the week, Acts 27, the disciples came together to break bread. So they came together for the purpose of worship. And in that worship, the Word of God had a very important place. See that this epistle be read among you. It wasn't for private consumption. It was to be read. Who's to do the reading? The minister. Paul writes to Timothy, Take heed to reading. It's a definite article in the Greek. The reading, that is, the public reading of the Word of God. And give people the sense of the Word of God so that they will understand and appreciate it. And the Word of God must never be pushed to one side because the people love to sing. Nonconformists have almost always built their chapels according to this plan, where the pulpit is dominant. It's in the central place, not tucked away like the Anglicans on the side of the building. And some altar takes its place. We don't put the sacrament where the Word of God should be. We put the Word of God in prime place. And in the service, the Word of God must have place. We sing the Word of God in the inspired Psalms. We read the Word of God in the Scripture readings. We preach the Word of God, or so we should, and faithfully bringing out the teaching of it. It was a privilege, no doubt, to be a member, one of the people at Colossae. The epistle was read, the whole of it. That's why we practice consecutive readings. The books of the Scripture were written to be read in the churches. 
however exercising that is, however difficult, we want the whole Word of God to be read to the whole people. Since we've done consecutive readings, we've read through the Bible three times, I would think. And the people who regularly attend this church have done what perhaps they haven't done in private. They have been able to read the whole of God's Word. So Paul reaches the end. And to these dear people, with a love for all Christians, but with a pleasing order, in the church at Colossae, pastor and people, he writes the salutation by the hand of me, Paul. A secretary or a menuensis had written the letter at Paul's dictation. But always in every letter, he signs himself to avoid forgery and to link himself to their hearts. Remember my bonds, I remember you. And in my bonds, I write this letter. While in those bonds, pray for me. Grace, which means the favor of God and all that flows from it, his love and all attending blessings, Grace be with you. What more could a church need? A sense of the divine goodwill and blessings for our hearts. Grace be with you. Amen. So be it. Amen. Let us sing now from the Psalm 25, first version of it, on page 25, and we sing four to seven. The tune is Serenity 162. The tune 162, the first version of Psalm 25, 4 to 7.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.